Wrights, good morning. It's good to be with you. Whoop, whoop. I love that. Uh, We're glad that you're here. As Tim mentioned, we are spending the fall looking at our heartbeat and mission as a church, why we exist, why Jesus' mission matters more to us than anything else, and what it means for our everyday lives. If you were with us last Sunday, we concluded our Made for Mission message series with a really powerful moment of many of us here standing to our feet and declaring our commitment to get out of the seats and into God's good plan for our lives that is reflected in a letter we spent four weeks looking at, Ephesians chapter 5, a big part of God's plan for our lives reflected in these words. Listen to them once again. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us as a sacrifice, a pleasing aroma to God. You know, and collectively we said we want to get out of our seats and we want to follow the example of Jesus by living a life filled with love. Because somehow, when we live a life filled with love, the watching world gets a glimpse of who Jesus is. Now, if you made that commitment and you're anything like me, you might be saying something to the effect of, okay, God, Father, I'm out of my seat and I'm ready to step into your plan for my life. What now? Anyone like that? I'm ready to go. What now? You ever ask that by faith? God, what now? What does it look like for my life? Don't leave me hanging up here alone. Anyone ever ever ask that? If not, we should be asking that, okay? Father, what now were you leading us? In my experience, um, following Jesus and stepping out in faith and making a commitment to him feels a lot like, it's just my experience, may not be yours, but feels a lot like skydiving, okay? Uh, Three years ago, Beth and I, we, we celebrated 40 years of life and we decided to go skydiving. Now, some people celebrate 40 years by doing spray tanning, some people do it by buying a new sports car, and we decided to flirt with death. And so we went to one of our favorite places in the world, uh, the southwest tip of Hawaii, and there we got on a plane and jumped out of it. The morning was really remarkable. It was a beautiful day. Uh, We arrived at the airstrip. We sort of legally signed our lives away. We met our jump instructors. Mine happened to be a five-foot-five hipster from Kansas, okay? Met him, learned what the day was going to be like, and all was going very well until we boarded and my instructor fastened his harness to mine and I was literally affixed to this dude and then things began to get real very quickly. We get on the plane, weather's beautiful, takeoff was smooth, ascent was stunning, we go 3,000 feet and then 5,000 feet and then 10 and then 12,000 feet in the air, and then it happened. The side door of the plane opens, and it's not a large plane. It's like a small plane. And so I'm on a seat not eight or 10 feet from the opening, and I start to see everyone in the plane moving up toward the opening. And, you know, everyone's got sort of their tandem instructor attached to them except for this guy in the squirrel suit. Every jumping plane has a guy in a squirrel suit going to fly out of that with nothing on, but it's unbelievable. And so we're in and we're moving forward to the door and one by one, people start to jump. And I don't know if you've ever jumped out of a plane or if you've ever watched someone jump out of a plane, but there's this unique moment that happens where the moment you jump, you're gone. Like, seriously, it's what it's like. You got to look this up and they fall out and they're gone. And then we keep nudging up, sort of the inertia of the plane is taking you forward, and then it's our turn. And we go to crouch by the open door, and I'm holding on to the handles for all that I'm worth. And the the guy's like, are you ready? You know, always a little more emphatic and dramatic than needs to be done. Are you ready? And two things going through my mind at this point. Number one, no, not really. I mean, and number two, what now? What now? What did I get myself into? And what are we going to do now? Of course, I knew the answer to that. And sensing my unease, I think the instructor, once again, 
a little bit more emphatic and, and dramatic than necessary, says, remember, head, back, knees up. And I thought, man, I can do this. And so kind of on the count of three, um, I let go of those handles. And me and my little five foot five hipster from Kansas fall over two and a half miles together. We didn't quite fall two and a half miles. That would have been a dramatic ending in and of itself. But we fell maybe some of that and then parachuted the rest down. And, and I just remember in this moment thinking, like, when, when you're letting go and putting your life in the hands of someone else's life, there comes this moment where you say, what now, what now, what now? And when you make a commitment to run after Jesus and to say, I'm going to live a life filled with love as you lead me, there's a moment where you say, but what now? What's that actually mean? Like, how do I actually do that? What does it look like to step into God's plan for my life when I'm at home sitting around the table with my family or I go into work tomorrow morning and I'm there in my cubicle next to my colleagues or I'm leading my business meeting in the business the boardroom or what's it look like when I go back to my neighborhood or when I walk my school hallways? How do I live a life filled with love there? What's it look like in the coffee shop where I frequent or the sports complex where we cheer our kids on in the sports that they're playing? What's it look like to live a life filled with love? What do we do now? And I hope that you're asking this question because over the next six weeks, we're going to look at God's plan for how we step into his, his good path for a plan for our lives. And I believe God will do something extraordinary through your life if you will commit to putting what we discover into action. Things we discover such as in the, in the book of Colossians, the letter of Colossians, that's a lot like the letter of Ephesians we spent the last four weeks looking at. You know, around 62 AD, this letter is written to a church in a city called Colossae, and it's there in the heart of Rome that followers of Jesus are learning how to live out God's plan for their life. And here's what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Notice first, if you and I are going to live out God's good plan for our lives, we must, notice the text, we must be among, live among, work among, play among those who do not yet know Jesus. And when you do, there's two things we see. Number one, we're to live wisely and then number two, we're to make the most of every opportunity, meaning we should live with and interact with others in such unusual and uh, unpredictable ways that our lives evoke curiosity amongst those who watch us. You know, Peter said something very similar in his letter. Listen to these words. You must worship Christ as the Lord of your life, and if someone asks you about your Christian hope, why you have the hope you do because of Jesus. Always be ready to explain it. But notice the progression again. As you follow Jesus and he becomes increasingly the king of your life at home or at work or at play or at dining, whatever it is, wherever you're at, your life will stir up questions from your friends and neighbors which will set the stage for you to explain your hope in Jesus. On the other hand, if who we are and how we live and what we do is just like every other suburban, middle class, family or individual, no one will be curious about the hope that is within us. Listen, if you have the same hectic schedule everyone else has, and you spend the sa your money in the same way that everyone else does, and you stay in the comfort of your driveway or lawn like everyone else has a tendency to do, and if you punch the clock Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday so that you can stay home on the weekends and binge watch HGTV, listen, no one is going to look at your life and say, wow, it's so different. It's so different. There's got to be something more compelling about our lives than the fact that we attend a worship gathering on the weekend. You know, when we look at the lives of the very first followers of Jesus, we see ordinary men and women living such extraordinarily different lifestyles that the watching world just took notice. They were compelled by it. For example, you could read this. Of course, you could read um, writings from 
advocates of Christianity who wrote in the early first century, or you could write, read writings from opponents to Christianity, and by and large, they all say the same thing, that these ordinary women and men loved their neighbors. They prayed for and responded with good toward their enemies. They forgave their persecutors. They cared for the poor, fed the hungry, took in the sick. In a society where men had three women, one for having sons, a concubine for having sex, and a mistress to make him look good in public, Christian men instead treated all women with equality and dignity. And they were sexually faithful to one woman. It was a radical departure from the societal norms around them. And in doing so, they literally shook the Roman Empire at its foundations as ordinary women and men bowed their knee to Jesus as king because of his good will. And as a result, you know, this is stunning. If you study, you know, the history of the church, within a few hundred years, over 40% of the Roman Empire bowed their knee to Jesus as king in a culture that was illegal to do so. And you say, well, why is that? It's because these women and men made a declaration in their lives, like you and I did, many of us last week, and said, we will live out the good plan of God for our lives by living a life filled with love. Listen, if we're going to do the same, you and I must discover a, a new way to live in many ways. You know, in his book, Surprise the World, it's also, you can look it up online, it's goes by a little bit of a different name, Five Habits for Highly Missional People. It's a bit of a mouthful, Five Habits for Highly Missional People. But we have the book upstairs in the bookstore called Surprise the World. It's a great read, pretty simple read. And in it, author Michael Frost describes how you and I need to adopt a new set of habits, Jesus-centered habits, that propel us outward into the lives of others and lead us upward into greater intimacy with Jesus. He says, you know, as a result of habits, so our lives go, meaning psychologists for a long time have understood that we are by nature creatures of habit, aren't we? Think about your life. Aren't you by nature a creature of habit? You repeat many of the same things again and again. For example, think about the seat that you're sitting in right now, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you for a show of hands in a moment. No shame in this, no shame whatsoever. Raise your hand if you are sitting in the same seat or general vicinity in which you tend to sit every Sunday. Get your hands up. There we go. See, we are some habit-oriented folk. There are some rebels amongst us, right? And you are much more free and happy than we are because we just get agitated, you know? Especially if, raise your hand. Raise your hand for a moment. If we are habit-centered folks, if you walk into this place, no shame in this, and someone happens to be sitting in your seat or in your general vicinity crowding you out, how many of us get a little bit like, you know, put off by that? Just raise your hand. No shame. No shame. Okay, some of you are just lying through your teeth, right? You're lying. That's a whole different message. Uh, no. We're a habitual folk. Think about your morning routine for a moment. How many of us drink the same cup of coffee and have the same breakfast and watch the same morning news or read the same news source every single morning? How many of us do that? Right, by routine. That's how we are. Beth and I pretty much go to the same breakfast joint every Friday morning, and then occasionally something comes about us, and we decide to try something different. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but no matter how good the food is in that other place, we're sitting there, and all I can think about is the place we usually go to, and I feel like I'm disloyal toward it, right? Because it's a break in my habit. This is my last one, and this is all applied to you know, so many of you. Uh, any, no shame in this. Any Diet Coke drinkers in the house, right? All right, I love you. I refer to you as DCers, okay? I work with a number of DCers. I love Diet Coke fans because, man, you are a habitual folk. You not only have to have your Diet Coke, you have to have it from the same gas station, over the same ice, in the same cup, lest you not have the same experience because it's better that way. And if anyone offers you Diet Coke out of a bottle, okay, it's like stabbing you in the back. It is just not okay, right? Because... It's out of a fountain. It's got to be the right what? Mix, right? You have your whole language that you use. Why? Because we're a habit-oriented people. In his book, The Power of Habit, author Charles Duhigg explains the science behind how habits impact every area of our lives. And, of course, you know, if you know Duhigg's story, he was a, 
a reporter in many of the wars, and in Afghanistan, he started to recognize the power of habits, and he wrote this book out of it and realized that 40% of our actions every day are the result of habits, not decisions. 40% of our actions. And scientists have found that the replacement of just one set of neurological patterns can overhaul pre-existing habits. Therefore, the best way to create lasting change in our lives is to develop a new set of habits. The Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung said that you are what you do, not what you say you'll do. Isn't that true? You are what you do, not what you intend to do. And so if you want to become a person who lives out the pattern of Jesus by living a life filled with love, you and I must adopt habits that will propel us forward into the lives of others to love them as Jesus does and did when he was here on earth. And so what I want to do in these six weeks is I want to give you a new set of habits. In fact, I'm going to look at five with you today, one, and in the subsequent weeks, we'll spend the last two weeks on the same habit, but from two different angles. And if you're taking notes, I want to talk about what I believe is a single, very important habit, very bottom rung that you and I can step into and begin making a profound difference in the lives of others. Write this down. I want to talk about the habit of blessing others, of blessing others. You know, the word blessing can mean a lot of things. You know, we bless sneezy people. We bless well-intentioned people. Bless your heart. We bless our food, our steak and potatoes before we eat them. We just bless everything. And the, that's great, but the problem with blessing everything is, in a sense, blessing can be nothing. So you got to kind of get back to what it actually means to bless someone. And at the root of the word, to bless someone means that we, we speak well of or we praise them. It can also mean that we make another person happy or that we add strength to their arm. That's what kind of a root of blessing means. So taken together, it means that to bless someone is to build them up or fill them with encouragement or to alleviate burdens in their lives, to strengthen them. I want to give you three ways to be a blessing to other people who surround you day in and day out, whereby to live out God's good plan for your life by loving them. The first is this. One of the most powerful ways to bless others is through words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. I have a file in my desk. Maybe you've got one like this where it contains many of the notes or cards or printed emails that I've received from people throughout the years who have spoken words of life into my life at just the right time. Some of them from many of you. And I keep those because there are seasons, if you live long enough, where you know you got to go back and you got to be reminded of the encouragement that people have said, right, that they've spoken. And so I'll go back to those, and you need this kind of file too. A written note of encouragement, a, a timely word spoken can bring life. You know, I love the story of Frank Blake, who served as the CEO of Home Depot for seven years. And if you know his story, he almost single-handedly turned the company around at a time when it could have moved toward bankruptcy, like all, you know, many of the other big box stores were doing. But Blake took over the CEO position in 2007 and served for the next seven years. And one of his defining habits was that every Sunday morning, Blake would go into his office at home and he would write note cards to employees to their stores across the nation, really across the world. And he would write for hours, not only to store executives, but to managers and his clerks and everyone, average employees. And as he did this, he began to build the company up literally through words of affirmation. Estimates say that in his seven years leading the company, Blake wrote over 25,000 notes of encouragement. 25,000 notes of encouragement. And Blake credits that habit with his influence at Home Depot because studies show that employees who feel appreciated are happier, more engaged, more productive, and more likely to contribute in positive ways, which means that as you write notes or type notes or text notes or send notes or speak notes of encouragement into someone's life, it can have a profound effect 
In fact, listen to these two Proverbs, really, really appropriate to this. Proverbs 12, 25, worry weighs a person down. Now stop there for a moment. Anyone in this room ever been worried? Anyone ever been weighed down by worry? Okay, good. Well, not good, but I mean, it's real, right? In those moments, have you ever had a person speak life into yours? Come alongside to strengthen, to bind up. Listen to the rest of the text. But an encouraging word cheers a person up. You know, Solomon goes on to say in Proverbs 12, some people make cutting remarks. You ever been the recipient of cutting remarks? Like you work, okay? Have you ever gone to school? It's about that basic. All we have to do is walk outside our front door. Some of us within our own home were surrounded by cutting remarks. All you have to do is turn the TV on, and life is filled with cutting remarks. But notice this. The words of the wise bring healing. You have an opportunity in a world where worry abounds and in a setting where cutting remarks just are all around to be able to bring words of healing healing and hope into the lives of your colleagues, the lives of your neighbors, the lives of your family and friends. And when you do, you cheer them up. And that's just not a word that just means like a little bit giddy. It means you make them happy in the deepest parts. It's a soul level happiness that Solomon's describing here. Words of affirmation are a powerful way to bless others. The second way you can bless them are through acts of kindness. You know, one of the reasons we love City Serve is uh, because it gets us out of the seat and into the streets together. And we get to pour out uh, kindness on our city and on our neighborhoods. But I'll let you into a little, uh, little saying we have. And uh, we're not sort of trying to dupe you, but I just want to let you know what we believe around here. We don't believe that the impact of City Serve stops at 4 p.m. last Sunday when all the shovels were put away, you know, or all the squeegees were put up until the next serve member. Everyone went to their homes, then city serve stopped. That's not the case. We believe city serve is a catalyst for greater acts of kindness in the hearts and through the lives of ordinary people like you and me. And the real win is when city serve becomes a movement in our lives, our everyday lives. And our prayers that city serve motivates us <clears throat> toward a lifestyle of kindness, where you go home and all of a sudden you see your neighbor who needs to help with yard cleanup this fall and you come alongside and you strengthen them. Or you meet a colleague out for coffee this week to listen and encourage. Or you offer to babysit someone else's kids who just needs a night out. Or you purchase groceries for a family in need. Or you invite someone into your home for dinner. Or you serve at a homeless shelter. Or whatever it might be that you become a person who excels in acts of kindness. And as you do them, and more, many more like them, you add strength to the arms of others and alleviate burdens. So practice words of affirmation. Practice acts of kindness. And number three, practice giving gifts. Now, I don't mean necessarily always monetary gifts, although sometimes it might be that, but I mean just random gestures of generosity. Years ago, author Gary Chapman released a book. I'm not necessarily recommending this book. I'm just going to tell you what book he released. It's, it's okay. It's called The Five Love Languages. And it came out right before Beth and I got married. And then we, we were kind of, you know, one of the first books that we read is how to actually love each other. And that's his premise. It's how do you communicate love in a way that reaches the heart of the person you're wanting to love. And so he goes through five. I don't have time to mention all five of them. But one of the ways that Chapman says we communicate love is by giving gifts. And another way we communicate love is by giving someone quality time. So gifts and time. So true story. Uh, early on in marriage, I, kind of a logical fellow, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna uh, do this. There's five love languages. I know two of them are gifts and time, which means if I do both, I've got a 40% chance of loving Beth really well, right? And so keep in mind, this is, you know, we had three kids at this time, all under the age of four. Beth's days are filled with diapers and messes and naps and bottles. And ladies, if you've ever been there, I mean, just, just say it. Like the last thing you want sometimes is for your husband to give him a gift of himself to you, okay? Let's be honest. And uh, maybe to help out, maybe to clean up the mess, maybe to keep the kids so you can go away, something like that. But I thought, man, I'm just going to give her a gift, and the gift's going to be me. 
And uh, long story short, yeah, a little bit arrogant, not so wise. And uh, long story short, I began to realize really quickly that that's not actually the way that Beth felt loved, that what Beth uh, feels loved by is when I give her a gift of time to herself. And so to this day, we joke that Beth's love language is time away from me, right? We're like, I just want to love me, babe. Just give me time. We'll just go away, right? Um, But I say that to mention that when it comes to giving gifts as a blessing to others in all seriousness, um, getting very creative at meeting the needs of others, really important. Blessing a single mom in your life with a food basket, providing classroom supplies with one of your child's, for one of your child's teachers years ago, Beth and I realized that uh, the educators in our kids' lives uh, had to buy their own school supplies. This was in New England. I'm guessing it was a similar way. Some of you are educators in the room. And so on top of making millions of dollars, uh, they also have to buy Kleenexes, all right, tissues. And we realized, you know, one of the simplest and yet profound ways to bless a teacher in her classroom is to give simple gifts. And so you can do that. You can do that. You can bless her or him in that way. You can deliver baked goods to each of your neighbors. You can come alongside a friend to help with an unexpected expense. You can invite a friend or family to dinner and pay the bill. You can find ways to express generosity in a way that matches the gifts of your family and then opportunities in front of you. And in doing so, two things happen. On the one hand, when you give gifts, the recipient of the gift feels loved and valued. You know, it shouldn't surprise us that generosity is at the heart of the gospel because Jesus said God so loved the world that he, what? He gave. So true love is always displayed through generous actions. But the other side of it is not only does the recipient feel loved, but your heart grows more and more like Jesus, who at the core of who he is, is a giver, which is why Luke records his words in Acts 20, when he said it is more blessed to what? To give than to receive. And so not only do you bless others, but your heart expands with generosity and Christ-likeness as you practice this habit. And so as I mentioned earlier, I want to encourage everyone here to bless three people this week. In fact, if you're taking notes, write that down. I wanna encourage you to bless three people this week. Let me explain that. I'll break it down just a little bit more. Number one, I want to encourage you to bless at least one person who is part of your local church this week. And if First Christian is your local church, then practice it here. If not, then go to your local church and practice it. Come alongside with a word of affirmation, encouragement, kindness, a gift to meet the need of someone here in your small group, your ministry team, in the vicinity of where you're sitting as you get to know them. The second thing is I want to encourage you to bless at least one person who doesn't yet know Jesus. So we're not only blessing internally in our community, but we're blessing externally through our lives. And then the third one, you just choose one or the other to bless. As you do this, blessing will begin to ricochet around this place as we encourage and act kindly and build up in a way that binds us together. But even more than that, these simple acts of blessing can have a huge evangelistic appeal. Some years ago, uh, a pastor and author by the name of Dave Ferguson was reviewing a doctoral study, and in the doctoral study, kind of in short, there were two missionary teams that were on their way to Thailand to set up camp and try to better Thailand and help people find Jesus. Uh, He looked into the study further and realized that there were two teams with two entirely different strategies. One team became known as the blessers, and their strategy was simply to go into Thailand and to bless every person they came into contact with. The other team became known as the converters, and their strategy was to go into Thailand and try to evangelize every person they encountered. What they found with time in the study was that, first of all, the blessers had a greater social impact than the converters. What this showed them was that the blessers' intention of blessing the people and the community around them resulted in tremendous amounts of social betterment and good. Now, that's just sort of a fancy way of saying that 
the blessers actually made Thailand better and the Thai people better. On the other hand, they found that the converters didn't have the same impact. At the, at the end of the day, the, ble- the, the researchers discovered that the blessers saw, check this out, almost 50 times as many people come to know Jesus as the converters. Look that. 50 times as many people came to know Jesus personally as a result of a strategy of living a lifestyle of love with every person you encounter. Now, that doesn't mean that people that set off to convert have an inappropriate strategy. What it might mean is that the strategy is less effective and maybe not what Jesus actually intended. When he called us to excel in loving our neighbors, and as we love our neighbors, doors are open for us to explain the hope that we have in Jesus. You see, when you live an unexpected life, which leads to blessing strangers, you will find yourself being questioned by others. Why? Why do you live this way? And as you do, it opens doors for you to share, First Peter 3, Colossians 4, the hope that you have because of Jesus. And so I want you to imagine with me this week. If, a, you know, a thousand adults roughly on any given weekend, give or take, gather here through our services, I want you to imagine with me if we were to go out this week, each of us committed to blessing three people. Over the course of the next seven days, 3,000 opportunities to bless others would come our way. If we were to continue that through the month, we would find 12,000 ways to be a blessing to others. And do the math through the end of the year. Imagine this, 36,000 opportunities to be a blessing to others. You see what happens is blessing just begins to ricochet around and it becomes contagious. And God uses it in surprising ways. And I believe he wants to do the same through you. And so I'd ask you this morning, where do you begin? Where would you begin? And I'm gonna pray for you, but as I do, I just want you to get a name or two or a face or two in your mind of someone that this week God might work through your life to bless in practical and profound ways. And how he might do something extraordinary as a result. So will you bow with me? I want to pray for you as we get ready to close. Father, we thank you that you came for us in Jesus, in the ultimate display of kindness. You gave your life for us. At great risk to yourself, by laying down your life, you wrapped us back up in your arms and you called us your own. And Jesus, now our lives transformed by your generosity. We also want to lead lives that are generous toward others. Our lives transformed by your blessing. We want to live lives that are a blessing to others. Our lives that are, have been made new by your kindness. Lord, we want to live lives that uh, evoke kindness toward, the other, toward others as well. God, we thank you for how you're already doing that. We pray that you will do more, and we offer our lives to you today for your glory. We pray these things together, Jesus, in your name, amen, amen.